It's my pleasure to introduce a truly remarkable individual, retired General Larry Spencer, the 37th Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Uh, General Spencer's journey from E-1 to four-star general in the United States Air Force is a testament to his exceptional leadership skills, unwavering de dedication, and relentless pursuit of excellence. Uh, general Spencer served in the Air Force for over 40 years, rising through the ranks from E-1, Airman Basic, to four-star general and becoming one of the most highly respected and accomplished leaders in the military. Along the way, he faced numerous challenges and obstacles but he never lost sight of his goals uh, or his commitment to serving his country. So General, if you wanna go ahead and start talking about like your journey into the Air Force sure. um, from the beginning, that would be perfect. Sure, well, first of all, thank you for having me and uh, thank you for your service. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, <laughs> my uh, entry into the Air Force is uh, a little bit unusual, still a little bit inexplicable today. Um, if you can picture this, I was uh, graduating high school um, and you know played just about every sport in high school. Uh, football was my primary sport. Um, had a lot of scholarship offers, uh, football scholarship offers. The challenge was I was the oldest of six in my family. My mother hadn't graduated high school. My father was an army soldier, no experience with college, no experience with recruiters. And it, it was just a very confusing time for me. I didn't really have any mentors to help me. Uh, essentially, once I graduated as a senior, you know, the, the, the football coach, I was no use to him. So I really didn't have any help. And so very confused. Um, so I, I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do. And that summer after graduation, I took a job with the Census Bureau in DC as a GS1. Um, and I was working there for a while, again, just trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do? I ended up, uh, D.C. at that time had a really robust semi-pro football league, so I got in that, uh, but still trying to figure out, okay, but what's the long term? And so uh, I was at work one day, and I decided to, to go down to the mall. Uh, it's called Iverson Mall in, in, uh, just outside of D.C. in Suitland, and I'm going to ask, you now you can see me, I don't know who else can, but uh, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination now because you're going to have to. Uh, but keep in mind, this was the 70s. Uh, and I had an Afro like you wouldn't believe back in the 70s. I know that's hard to believe now. Uh, I wish I could grow one now, but I can't. Um, <laughs> and, and so I, I went down to the mall. And of all things, I bought a purple jumpsuit uh, with, with matching high platform shoes. And again, that was back during the time where, you know, bell bottoms and all that stuff was popular. And I bought a wide brimmed black hat. Um, and so I, I'm walking through the mall with my bag and I happened to see an Air Force recruiter's office. Um, and I wasn't that interested in joining the military. Uh, although my father had been in the army for 20 years, uh, I didn't have anything against the military. It just wasn't the thing to do because this was coming off the tail end of Vietnam. And, you know, the military just wasn't a very popular place to go in, place to, to be. So uh, to make a long story short, uh, I, the recruiter came out. I literally sort of stumbled into the recruiter's office. And when I stumbled out of there, I was in the Air Force. It, it was that uh, fast and it was that uh, unplanned. Uh, my parents didn't know anything about it. Uh, and so I ended up joining the Air Force, enlisted, uh, loved it, uh, went to basic training, loved basic training, uh, tech school, and then off to my first base at Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina, and uh, just loved it. Uh, and uh, started working on my degree. Uh, and I'll tell you how that came about, because uh, it's a, I want to make a point, uh, because anyone that knows me knows how much I respect and honor our enlisted force. And there's many reasons for that. Uh, for one, I mean, anyone with any sense knows that our adversaries fear us, not because of our officers, but because of our enlisted force. Um, and so, um, so, picked, so I've been in now a couple of years. I get assigned to um, 
CCK Air Base in Taiwan. We don't even have that base there anymore. And I'm on the base basketball team, having a good time. I think I'm a two-striper at that point. point. Uh, again, uh, hair all over the place. Now, back then, uh, you know, we pushed the envelope. I, I, I mean, I, I, it's, I don't even like admitting it, but I, I was young and, you know, all my friends were doing it. That's not a reason to do it, but I was doing it. Uh, and so I had really long hair. When I got there, I worked in the post office. And our uh, supervisor, who was a master sergeant who ran the post office, and he told us, he said, look, I don't care what you do with your hair. Just don't get in any trouble. S stay in the back. So I stayed in the back. We put up mail from the back. And I kept my hat on all day. Um, and there was an art to this, by the way, of using a stocking cap to patch, you know, pack your hat down, it, uh, hair down. It's kind of silly to think about it now, but that's what we did. So anyway, we, we made a bet. Uh, that we could go a whole year without a haircut. And keep in mind, my hair was already too long when I got there. So lo and behold, I went a whole year on a remote tour without getting a haircut. And I got my assignment back to the States to Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. Now, I didn't know anything about Whiteman Air Force Base, never been to Missouri in my life, but my friends started laughing because they said, do you realize Whiteman Air Force Base is a part of Strategic Air Command they don't have a strategic air command anymore. The old SAC, it's strategic command now. But SAC back in the day was known as the, the spit and polish by the book command. And so they were all laughing because they knew I wasn't going to maintain that hair length once I got back there. So let's fast forward now. I was able to disguise my hair even after, after I got to Whiteman until one day, uh, my wife and I went out to, my hair was so long, my my wife would braid it on the weekends. And I had braids all the way down my back. I, I know it's hard to believe now, uh, but it, it was crazy. So uh, one night we went out to the movies. I did not have a chance to um, disguise, for lack of a better term, my hair. And so I went in early the next morning and here I am in uniform uh, as an Amherst first class with hair all over the place. And so I'm sitting there just thinking about the trouble I'm going to get in when my boss comes in. And so I'm sitting there and my desk was actually facing the door. And early in the morning, a chief master sergeant walks by the door, looks in and doesn't say anything, but kept walking. And so I kind of wiped my brow, you know, wow, I got away, for, got away with it for at least for the next few minutes. And then something strange happened because this was before Michael Jackson made this popular, but I swear that chief master sergeant literally moonwalked back uh, to that doorway and looked in and said, I can't believe what I'm seeing. So he said, get up from your desk and come with me. And I said, well, chief, I can't, I can't you know, my, my, I was trying to make excuses. My boss said not in yet. He said, get up from your desk, grab your hat and come with me. So I grabbed my hat, which I couldn't get on anyway. Uh, and went out to his, <laughs> maybe you can tell me this, I, I don't know why, it's every chief master sergeant I've ever met had a pickup truck. I don't know why, but he had one too. So we got in his pickup truck and we went over to the base barber shop. He told the barber to give me a military haircut. So he sat there with a smile on his face. He paid the barber and I sat there and watched all my hair fall on the floor. And so when we got, when I got done, I assumed he was going to take me back to work. But when we got into the truck, he said, look, don't worry about work. I'll, I'll, I'll work that with your supervisor. I just want to have a talk with you. And I said, OK, chief. So we went over to the base park and he started talking to me in a way that no one had ever talked to me before. It wasn't like he was chewing me out, but he was very clear that, you know, look, if you want to grow your hair down to the ground, he said, I don't care, but just get out of the Air Force and do that. But if you're going to be in the Air Force, you need to follow standards. And again, he was he was being direct, but I didn't feel offended or I didn't feel like he was trying to get me in trouble. Maybe for the first time, I literally felt like this guy really cared about me. And he said, you know, I've seen you around. You look like you, you know, you do a pretty good job. Uh, why would you why would you come in the Air Force and, and not follow the standards? So so I said, OK, you know, he was right, obviously. And I said, OK, I, I got it. And he said, okay, you're married. You got a couple of kids. You're a young guy. You know, what are you going to do uh, with your career? And I said, like every other airman said back then, I said, well, I'm getting out, you know, after four years, whether we were or not, what did, you know, didn't seem to matter. That's what we all said. 
So he said, well, that's fine. But he said, in the meantime, what are you doing with your life? I mean, you don't want to come in the Air Force and leave with the same thing you came in with. He said, are you taking college courses? And I said, no, I've been thinking about it. And he said, well, it's time to start, stop thinking about it. So we got back in his pickup truck. He took me over to the base education office. He signed me up for two co college courses on the spot. And he stayed with me until I finished my college degree. And he attended my graduation. And he helped me fill out my application for officer training school to, 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 to go to OTS. Uh, and, and the reason I like telling that story is because I, I two reasons. One is I want to impress upon anyone that will listen how important mentors are. Uh, if, if you don't have a mentor, go get, go get not one, go get several. Um, my recommendation is to find mentors both in your chain, outside your chain. I use mentors today. You know, we all, regardless of where we are in our careers, where we are in our lives, we all need, you know, someone occasionally to run something by uh, and, and to talk to someone about something. Uh, and so uh, that mentorship became very important to me. Uh, the other reason, though, is because there are a lot of Airmen Spencers out there that are waiting for mentors uh, and that are waiting for someone to have that talk with them the way that chief had a talk with me. I, the reason I know they're out there because I made it my career's work to do that in the Air Force. And, I, and I've talked to hundreds of airmen and even lieutenants uh, that were otherwise probably going down the wrong path. But I grabbed them and took them into a room and closed the door and said, look, we need to have a talk. Uh, and that's what a lot of them need. You know, I, I get frustrated sometimes when commanders and first sergeants allow lawyers to take over their jobs from them. And don't get me wrong, I, I love lawyers and, and we need lawyers. But, you know, typically what happens is some person, someone gets in trouble or they do, do something they shouldn't have done. And you start the process of, you know, uh, whether it's uh, Article 15 or letter reprimand or whatever, and they're on now a path to, to being kicked out of the Air Force. When in a lot of cases, that person is not, th their character is not bad. They're just young and immature in a lot of cases, like I was. I was just young and immature. And, you know, why we think somehow that 18-year-olds are in high school one day you know, doing who knows what. I, I won't even speculate because I know what I did when I was in high school. Uh, and and within the period of basic training, what I don't know if it's six weeks or however long it is now, uh, suddenly they're a new person. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. It does with, with some. I mean, some folks, the light bulb comes on right away. Some folks, it doesn't. I mean, I, I've seen that with my own kids. I have three kids and they all mature at different times. So it bothers me sometimes when commanders and first sergeants don't take the time to mentor and nurture uh, young airmen uh, or even young officers, depending on the case, uh, rather than just sort of say, okay, they got in trouble, we're going to process them out. Um, so that's sort of one of my pet peeves. But, uh, I, you know, that chief master sergeant, literally, there is no question about it, changed the trajectory of my life, changed my life. Uh, I don't know where I would have been had he not have come along. And so one, I think as a as an individual, we should all seek out and and try to get ourselves as many mentors as we can. And we should be mentors and be open to mentor others because there are folks out there who need you. Uh, no question about it. All right, can you hear me now? All right, perfect. All right, so you started out as a finance airman, correct? Correct. All right, I think we have something in common because I worked in the military post office as well. Oh, wow. um, I did that when I was over at Capone Air Base uh -huh. in Germany. Uh -huh. um, so how did working in the finance um, kind of shape you to be an officer? Yeah, good question because so I, I came back uh, to Whiteman, and I was still, they don't, the, the career field now that's called communications used to be called admin or administration. Uh, and I wanted to do something different. 
And I had a friend in finance uh, and, and uh, or, you know, in the comptroller career field. And I decided I wanted to cross train because I just wanted to do something different. Uh, and because I really liked dealing with numbers. And back then, uh, they're part of, uh, of the comptroller squadron was called management analysis, where you got to go around and do time motion studies and do efficiency studies, which is something I really enjoy because one, because I'm just so cheap. Uh, you know, I, I know all about saving money. So, uh, so I cross trained. Uh, and at, at the same time, I was going to college to get my college degree. Um, but yeah, I ended up really enjoying it. I, I met some really good people. I you know, I felt like uh, I was contributing and I was learning. Um, the, the good thing about working in the comptroller squadron, whether you're in finance, counting and finance or budget, you get to know what happens on the entire base um, because everybody needs money. And so whether you are on the flight line, whether you work in CE, personnel, uh, hospital, it doesn't matter. The, the finance folks know what you do because they have to give you the money to do it. And so it was a really, I think, good career field for me to start out in because uh, I got to do something I enjoyed. And I also got to understand the base better, understand the Air Force better. So it was really good for me. So what, what kind of set your trajectory to be the vice chairman um, of the Air Force? <laughs> or vice chief of staff of the Air Force. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah that's uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. You mentioned that because I don't know. I, you know, when I when I uh, got my degree, uh, I got accepted for OTS. Uh, again, started out in finance and as a, as a second lieutenant. Um, I, I you know I people ask me all the time. You know, um. How do, how do you become a four star? And, and one, I can't answer that because one, I think it's the wrong question. Uh, and I don't think there is a formula for that and, and neither should there be. Because I, I, had one, I had a captain one time ask me, you know, he said, sir, I, I wanna be a four star general. How, what do I need to do? <laughs> and my answer to him was, you need to make major first. That's, that's what you need to do. Uh, and so I, I, I caution people just to put one foot in front of the other, don't try to do any more than that. Uh, and I've also always believed in, um, you know, those who say they can and those who say they can't are normally both right. Uh, and so at some point I figured out, you know, even though I had a tough, I grew up in a tough neighborhood, had a poor education, um, low self-esteem from living in that environment, at some point, I figured out, you know, I can do what everybody else is doing as long as I'm willing to put in the work to do it. Um, I can get good grades in school as long as I'm willing to study. Uh, and so once I figured that out, I just took one at a time. I, I never, never thought I would be a colonel, much less a four star. Uh, and so as I progressed up the ranks, it wasn't about the next grade or how far I can go. It was about doing the best job I could where I was at the time, you know, bloom where you're planted. And, and that was my philosophy all the way through. I never in a million years thought I would be the vice chief of staff of the Air Force, especially as someone who was not a pilot. Uh, you know, it's just, it just doesn't happen. And so again, I, I just, you know, I, I, I think if you lose sight of doing the best job you can in the job you're in now, you can get yourself in trouble, I think. Yeah, I think it's a pretty amazing feat, you know, especially not being a pilot, being the first um, financial officer to to meet that or to go up that high, which is pretty awesome, um, pretty amazing. Um, but one of the things that I want to touch on, right, is I have a lot of people that come into my office, um, specifically like junior ROTC in the high schools and everything like that, right? They're set on that ROTC path, that path of commissioning. Uh, I don't know if it's just like ingrained in them from the RO, JROTC instructors, but they, you know, a lot of them come in, they're like, you know, I want to be an officer. I want to be in charge of people. Um, it, and some of those kids that go to ROTC in college as well, right? I want them to get, you know, to understand that you can come in enlisted, you know, you, you're a perfect example. Went all the way from E1 to, to O10 to general right? Uh, number two in the Air Force, which is amazing. Um, 
I just want people to understand that you can do that, come in listed, and then go all the way up to the top. Um, it's possible. So, no, it's, it's absolutely possible. I mean, it, it, it happens all the time. And again, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. And so, you know, I, I think, I, I don't think it, it needs to be that complicated. Um, you know, you just need to, you, you know, to, to work hard and to perfect whatever craft you're in. I mean, you know how many finance folks have been gone above, just above the grade of two star? The, the answer is one. And, and it is not because of me. I'm not any better than anybody else. So I, I don't mean to imply that at all. But I think a lot of times folks are told they can't do something. I, I can't tell you the number of times I was told what I could not do. You're not a pilot. You can't do this. You're a finance guy. You, you know, even as a three-star general, I was the J-8 on the joint staff. And the, uh, they, you know, I don't know how it is with you, but even before anyone told me anything, you know, rumors started getting out that, hey, I might be nominated for the vice chief and nobody had told me anything. Um, but I had very senior folks calling me saying, hey, I heard the rumor, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's not going to happen because they're not going to put a non-pilot in, you know, as vice chief of staff. Uh, and by the way, I wasn't bucking for the job. I wasn't campaigning for it. I didn't ask for it. Um, so it's not like I would have been disappointed had I not gotten that job, but I never let people tell me what I couldn't do. Uh, and, and because there's a lot of people out there that will do that. Um, I don't know how much time you have. I don't want to, I don't want, I don't, cause I could talk about this stuff all day, but just really quick to, just to illustrate where that came from. A lot of folks ask me, what was the most important lesson in, in life you ever learned? And, and that's an easy one for me because. It was even though I grew up in Southeast DC, I spent the summers on my grandfather's farm in Southwest Virginia. He grew tobacco. And so uh, that's where I learned probably the most valuable lesson I ever learned. Uh, so just to give you a sense for this farm was about 60 acres. It was out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, the only time we left that, that location was on Sunday. My, my grandfather was a deacon in the church and uh, we went to Baptist church, which meant we stayed in church all day, on, almost all on Sunday. Uh, other than that, though, we didn't even go to the store. I mean, we were on that farm all the time. And uh, one summer I went down, I was maybe 11, 12 years old, and I had a cousin my same age. I would hang out with him while I was there. This particular summer, he was visiting his mother in Philadelphia, so it was just my grandfather and I for a couple of weeks. And we were both sort of introverts. We didn't talk a lot, but he thought I was just a lazy, you know, city kid who wouldn't amount to anything. And so this particular summer, he decided he was going to, you know, mentor me. And so uh, as an example, he thought he, he, he started teaching me what he called pearls of wisdom. So as an example, one day he asked me, do you know the difference between a mule and a donkey? And I was like, no, I don't really have any desire to know. But he said, well, you need to know. So he told me, okay, I, I don't, I've never used that information since then, but I know. He also said, uh, even a blind rooster finds a kernel of corn every now and then. I have no idea what that means, but, but you know, he was dropping these pearls of wisdom on me. So, um, so our, our typical routine was we get up in the morning. Uh, I have no idea how a rooster knows it's 5.30, but the rooster crowed every morning at 5.30. We were up, big breakfast my, with my grandmother on a wood burning stove. Uh, you know, everything, fresh eggs, the bacon was from the farm. Everything was from the farm. Uh, she made her own bread every day. And so our normal routine was to do some chores in the morning, get on his tractor and go out to one of the many tobacco fields. This particular day though, he hitched up his horse. He had a big farm horse and he hitched to it a platform with no wheels on it. You just pulled it flat along the ground. Um, and he put a plow on the platform. I got on the platform with the plow and he pulled us, the horse pulled us out to some vacant field and he got behind that horse and hooked up the plow and started plowing these rows. And I was transfixed. I mean, I, I was never seen anything like this. Just amazed at, at how he was in rhythm with the horse. The rows were perfectly straight. I remember watching the dirt turn over. It was just amazing to me to watch this. And so he got about halfway through and he had to take a potty break. So he 
got from a, took the reins from around him and left the horse there in, in the plow and disappeared into the woods. So I'm thinking, okay, he thinks I'm lazy. I don't have any initiative. You know, I'm a city kid. I'm going to show him. I'm going to get out there and plow these roads while he's in the, while he's in the woods. So I get out there. I had, by the way, I've never plowed before. I had no idea what I'm doing. The plow was about the same size I was. I, I barely got it upright. Put the reins behind me. And I knew the command to make the horse go forward. And so the horse started walking. And so I'm barely keeping up. The problem is the horse is now cutting diagonally across my grandfather's perfectly plowed rows, just destroying what he had done. And I don't know what to do because I don't, I didn't know the command to make the horse stop. Uh, and so I, I'm panicking. Now, let me pause for a second because I don't want anyone to think that um, that I'm that, that I'm any way endorsing this, okay, as a parent. But this was in the '60s, and trust me, in the '60s on a farm, you could whip your kids, and so that's what out. And the disciplinary tool of choice was called a switch, which was essentially a branch off a tree. And so I'm thinking about, oh my God, I mean, he never whipped me before. But I'm looking around. We're in the middle of the woods, uh, and this is it because I'm, you know, I'm going to get in a lot. I'm going to get in trouble. So that's what I'm thinking about. And so, as I'm trying to keep myself upright, don't know how to stop. My grandfather runs out of the woods and he says, "Larry, what are you doing?" And if you can picture this, I turn to look at him, but the horse is still walking. So I'm stumbling, going sideways. I, I dropped the reins and put my both hands up to try to balance myself from falling on the ground. And just instinctively, you know, I just kind of yell out, you know, kind of, whoa, whoa, of course, the horse stop. That was, that was the command to make the horse stop. I didn't know that at the time. So now I'm standing there. My grandfather's charging across the field. I'm looking at all these switches around. And when my grandfather got up to me, he said something to me that was not very articulate or, or probably grammatically incorrect. But it was something that he said that stuck with me my whole life, sticks with me today. And what he said was, it's okay to try and fail, but it's not okay not to try. And what he meant by that was, look, you know, you tried and I'm proud of you for trying. But by the way, throughout your life, there's always going to, there's always going to be challenges and things that you don't think you can do and things that you're going to think are hard to do, but go, tr but don't, don't. Uh, fail to try simply because you think you're going to fail. Get out there and try anyway. And that has guided me my whole life. Um, uh, you know, I tell everyone that, you know, you can't score a touchdown sitting on the bench. You got to get out there and get in the game. And so, you know, when you're going to work every day, you know, what's on your boss's plate? What's keeping them up at night? You know, look around your squadron, your flight, your wing. I mean, what, what how can I contribute? How can I make things better? You know, are you just coming in every day at work every day and then going home? Or are you coming in really trying to make your unit better? And that's kind of the way I approached, you know, I, I you know, I don't know that that uh, that contributed to where I eventually ended up. But that was my approach that wherever I work and even if I may not may not be the smartest one in the unit, but I, you know, I'm going to outwork everybody. And so. Uh, and I'm going to raise my hand and volunteer for the hard jobs. Uh, and so I'm not saying I'm not recommending that to anyone else. I'm just saying that was my way of, of, of sort of navigating the Air Force is uh, I'm going to come in every day and figure out how I can make my unit better. And that's kind of that was kind of my philosophy. All right. So I've had a, this is probably my sixth base in my 14 years. Um, a lot of overseas tours and everything, right? TDYs and deployments. Uh, one of the things I've always saw is, you know, a lot of my squadron commanders or flight commanders, group commanders, all of the ones that have been enlisted before, like the Mustangs, like yourself. Um, I feel like a lot of them, I'm not going to say they're, I'm not going to say better. However, I, I feel like they listen a lot more. Um how did your enlisted experience, you know, as an airman, how did that translate into your leadership as an officer? Yeah, great question. There's no, there's, there is no question at all. Having been enlisted gave me a huge jump uh, on my peers once I became a, a lieutenant. It wasn't even close. 
so first, so example, I, my first base as second lieutenant was Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. And the first thing I did, as opposed to my peers, uh, I went and found me a senior NCO to help me. And I said, look, I, you know, I need some mentorship. I'm a second lieutenant. I, I, I'm, I'm learning here. You know, can you help me? Uh, and, and, and I had several of those. And, and by the way, they were all very, uh, very helpful and very willing to do so. My peers wouldn't do that. You know, I'm a lieutenant. I'm an officer. You know, I'm not going to get an enlisted guy. That, OK, well, fine. Just 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 feel that way if you want to. Um, so that that's one. Two is I understood the system. You know, so, for example, uh, as a second lieutenant at Robbins, I mean, I was officer of the quarter and then officer of the year. My friends were, 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 were kidding me about it. And I'm saying, OK, guys, you have no idea. You know, I, I know what that means, because when my OPR is due, you know, it's going to have I'm going to have something to put on it uh, and you're not. Uh, so I, I understood how the system worked. Um, I understood how important performance reports were. I understood that you can't take off. You know, you can't sort of say, OK, you know, I just got a and, you know, and uh, an EPR and OPR or PRF or whatever. So I, I got a good one you know, or what you, or at least what you thought was a good one. And, and then I, you know, I don't, I can coast for six months and then I'll get serious again. You can't, it doesn't work that way. Um, so I understood how that whole evaluation system worked, but more, more than that, again, come as enlisted, I understood, I, you know, I don't know if they probably don't have it anymore. When I was testing WAPS testing, there was a, I, you can tell, you can correct me because I'm sure they've changed the names by now, but there were two tests, a skill knowledge test, SKT, and a, a, a PFE was, what's that, professional something evaluation. Anyway, there, and I think it's called something different now, but you know, you had the sort of the test of your career field and then the general military knowledge, you had to test on both. And the PFE book, uh, a promotion fitness exam is what it was called probably call something else now, but the opening line in that book stuck in my mind now 40 years later. The opening line in that book was, NCOs are the backbone of the Air Force. And I believe that uh, because I saw it every day. You know, I saw, if you go around the base, you know, who's who's turning the wrench on the flight line? Who's getting airplanes off the ground? You know, who's who's processing people uh, you know, through personnel and through who's who's paying the travel vouchers, you know, who's who's running, you know, help getting people in the hospital, um, you know, who's in civil engineering, you know, who's out there fixing stuff. Uh, it, it was that core group, of, that enlisted core. Uh, and so I understood that. Uh, and, and some of my a lot of my peers didn't, especially not as second lieutenants. Um, so I think I, I think I had a big so I, I big jump on them because uh, you know, I embraced our enlisted force. And I, like you said, I listened to them and I, I asked them, hey, what do you think? Or, you know, what should we do here? I don't know. You know, we got any ideas. Um, and and so I, I, there is no question about it um, that um, my enlisted time clearly uh, put me ahead of my peers as an officer. Now, that said, it, unfortunately, that can work the other way because there are some prior enlisted officers who think they know it all uh, because they were enlisted. It was interesting, when I was in OTS, um, all, you could tell all the prior enlisted folks in, uh, uh, in OTS because they all wore the ribbons. And, and that was a big deal. You know, you walked around with all your ribbons on, um, and, uh, which was fine, but uh, a lot, sometimes that kind of went to their heads. And, and so, uh, I, I think, you know, sometimes you have to be careful about that, you know, stay humble, but, but yeah, it was, um, I, I would, by the way, I would have been perfectly happy staying enlisted, you know, trying to end up a chief master sergeant at some point. So, it, so it wasn't that I wanted to be commissioned for any other reason other than I thought it would give me more opportunities to lead. And that, that's what it was all about for me. Yeah, definitely. I've always just seen people give more respect towards those those officers that were prior enlisted because they've been through a lot of the stuff that they've already been through down in the trenches, so to speak. Right. 
Um, one of the other big things, right? So you have three kids, you have a wife um, that you've been married to for a while now. How did you balance that work life? Um, how'd you do that work life balance throughout the years? Um, Cause you were in 44 years, correct? Yeah. yeah that's a, that's a great question. And, and I get that question all the time. Um, because, you know, in the, in the military, you know, we're, we're essentially on duty 24 hours a day. Um, the but is that does not mean you need to work 24 hours, be at work 24 hours a day. And I think there are times in the military that you have to surge. I mean, obviously, if you're deployed and you're you're in a war zone, I mean, that's what you that you have to your total attention is there. But that's not you're not in a war zone, you know. Uh, uh, very long, which is th thankfully. And if you're at work, I mean, you know, I, I went in the Pentagon the first time, unfortunately, as a second lieutenant. Oh, I'm sorry, first lieutenant, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody. And back in those days, it was a real sweatshop. And, uh, you know, I remember my first uh, day on the job, my boss told me I was the only lieutenant in there. Uh, basically say, hey, this is the Pentagon, you know, we work late, we work weekends. So, you know, you're just gonna have to, you know, kind of get, you know, get over that. Um, and, and, you know, in the same breath, he said, but, you know, make sure you spend time with your family. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and so I was a bit scared because I was a first lieutenant, but I wanted to work as hard as I could. And not shortly after I got there, my youngest son had had real issues with asthma as he was growing up. And they were they finally got to the point where they wanted to give him a test uh, where they essentially give you a shot, you know, about 40 shots and, you know, and see what happens. Um, and they were going to do that at Walter Reed uh, Army Hospital. And so I went into my boss and I said, you know, I know what you said about, you know, you don't like us leaving once we get here to work. But. I don't want my wife to have to go over to Walter Reed with my young son and taking 40 shots by herself. I mean, I, I need to be there. And he basically looked at me and said, well, you know, I'm not going to tell you not to do it, but I'm, I don't think you should. That's what he told me. Uh, and so, you know, I, I talked to one of my mentors uh, and who, who recommended I, you know, get my life priorities straight. And I went. Um, and, 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 and you know what happened when I got back to work the next day, nothing, uh, I, I went on about my business. Uh, and so it, it was, you know, it, I remember there were many times when I was in the Pentagon that my boss would say, you know, you have to have this on in my, on my desk before you go home tonight. And we were literally, when I worked in budget in the Pentagon, we literally had cots in the, in the, in the building. And there were nights where folks spent the night there. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, it's a lot better now. But, but back then, before you had computers and all the automation, it was pretty tough. And, um, and I would stay up late, miss my carpool. My wife would have to drive up at, to get me at 11 o'clock at night to take me home. And I'd get in the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and then two weeks later, that thing's still sitting on the boss's box, so inbox. So, you know, it, it was all self-inflicted stuff. Um, and so I, I learned over the years that, you know, as you know, probably better than I, you know, we recruit the member, but we keep we keep the family. And, and you know, one of the things I wanted to, when I finished my Air Force career, because, you know, there, there's not many things certain in life, but one of those certainties is you're going to get out of the Air Force at some point. Uh, they're going to make you get out whether you want to or not. And so what I was, but you, you want your family intact, though, through that. I mean, is it worth sacrificing your family? Uh, I don't think so. And by the way, it's not necessary. It, it really isn't. So I, I won't sit here and say that it was easy to balance work and life. It was not. And there were there. Were, I had some long days, long nights, some weekends. Uh, but I, I would say two things. One is, my family and I uh, accepted that if I was going to stay in the Air Force, there was going to be occasion where I would have to be late. There would be occasions where I might have to deploy somewhere, go TDY. That's part of this job. 
And if you all aren't with me on that, this is not going to work. So I think the first thing to sort of recognize is um, it has your family has to be in it with you. Uh, you. You can't do that alone. I mean, assuming you have a family, you can't do that alone. Uh, but again, I think the second thing is as we get into supervisory positions, we need to remember the bad things that happened to us and not inflict those on those who are working for us. Um, so even when I was in the Pentagon, I got when I was a, the budget director, you know, I called I called a a almost what you call maybe a town hall meeting when the commander's called because it wasn't a commander the first day. And I said, look, uh, you want to impress me in this job and you all worried about getting, you know, good OPRs and good EPRs and all that. You want to impress me? Get your work done on time and go home. That that impresses me. If you're hanging around here in here watching the clock thinking that's going to impress me, that's not going to do it. I, I'm focused on what you produce, not on how many hours you put on the clock. And by the way, if your kids have something that you need to go to, you know, you name it, uh, whatever, they might have something in school, they may have something going on, they may have something medically, go do it. Because when when you're here, I need you to I need you here with your with your family intact. I don't want, you know, you're not, you're not that much good to me if you're sitting here worried about your spouse or worried about your kids. So I think uh, work-life balance is something we have to continually focus on, work on, uh, because, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of supervisors out there who measure your worth and measure your, um, you know, measure your potential on, on how late you stay at work. Uh, and that's, in my opinion, is the wrong metric to use. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. It's it's definitely kind of hard. Like I've got a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old daughter and a wife, and we just got here to uh, the Cocoa Beach area for recruiting. Um, it's definitely been a lot of long hours, so we're trying to still get adjusted to the work-life balance with all of the activities that I got to do for recruiting. Right. So we're still definitely getting that down so yeah recruiting is tough business and it, it is you know you got to go to the schools you have to go meet people you know doing off-duty hours no question about it yeah so one of the things i want to ask is like what advice do you have for young people considering the air force you know particularly those who want to start enlisted right yeah i i, I uh as recent as a couple of days ago i continually recommend young folks join the military I'm a little prejudiced toward the Air Force, obviously, or biased toward the Air Force. Uh, but particularly if they're not sure what they want to do um, or if they want to, uh, you know, serve the country uh, or if they just want to go do something that's exciting. Um, I recommend to folks all the time to come in the Air Force and look, if you like it, fine. You know, you can stay or you know, you get the GI Bill if you want to do four years and, and go to college or, or you can stay in and go to college like I did. I mean, there, if there are so many, the, the opportunities are wide open. I mean, you can literally step in the Air Force. In fact, my, I have a grandson that I just recommend that he think about the same thing because because uh, he's not exactly sure what he wants to be when he grows up. And by the way, most of us are like that. Um, you know, not not many of us come out of the womb knowing exactly what job we want or, you know, profession we want. So it takes a little bit of, you know, let me try this and then let me try that, which is fine. Uh, but the military offers so much. I mean, you can come in enlisted. You got your medical, you know, your health care taken care of. You got a place to live. You, you're going to eat every day. Um, so your basics are taken care of. The bigger thing is you're going to learn a heck of a lot. I mean, you're going to learn a valuable skill. Um, you're going to, you're going to travel the world. Uh, you're going to meet some incredible people and you do all of that and, and get to serve your country at the same time. So, you know, it's a, it's a win-win in my, in my view, I, I, there's no, no downsides to it that I'm aware of. Um, so especially now you think about the cost of college, even if you want to go to college, uh, you know, student loans that people are trying to pay off. Uh, again, I'm not suggesting one way or the other. It's just, that I, you know, I would recommend anyone. Uh, particularly if they don't know, you know, if you're, if your whole life you wanted to be a doctor and, you know, you, you've got, you know, great grades and SAT scores in high school and you get accepted to a great medical school 
and you get a scholarship, hey, go for it. I, I, and I wouldn't try to talk you out of that at all. But, but, but how many of us are, were in that situation? Not many. Uh, and so for me personally, uh, the Air Force was a great place to start. I, I can't think of a better place to start. Uh, by the way, I, I am biased to the, for the, to the Air Force. And I've gone to a lot of, I've been in a lot of joint jobs and been in a lot of, and I actually went to Marine Corps Command Staff College. So I've been to joint uh, education courses and, and they give us a hard time about, you know, which service is the best. Uh, they are, they're all great, by the way. But at the end of the day, if you ask them, what service do you want your kids to go into? They all say the Air Force. Yeah, I've, I've had a lot of that. I've had a lot of, uh, you know, the Army recruiters and everybody reaching out to get my card for um, for their kids. So I actually enlisted one of the Army recruiter's sons. So wow. <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> um, wow. So over, over the last 40, uh, close to 50 years now, how do you think the Air Force has changed over the years? And what do you think the future holds for the next generation of airmen? especially with the conflicts that we're starting to come into now. I don't say conflicts, but the stuff that we're seeing on the news, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me say a couple of things. One is the, the military uh, in the, in the air force in particular is continually gets more and more technical. Um, and so th the skills that folks are bringing to the air force uh, are, are a lot more technical than they used to be one and for airmen a lot smarter than they used to be too. So, so that, that all makes sense. Um, the challenge is, you know, better than I, that less than 25% of those 18 to 24 in our country are even eligible for military service. Uh, you know, things like criminal record, drugs, um, you know, physical fitness uh, are prohibiting folks to come in. So you have a small pool to work with as it is. But I think the Air Force has changed a lot, uh, mostly for the better. Uh, one thing that, that has changed some that I don't like is sort of the, uh, particularly within the NCO ranks, is the accountability for everyone, not just your own unit. So, for example, when I came in as a one striper, if I was walking across the base and my shoes weren't shined or, my, you know, my uniform wasn't right, some NCO, they didn't care who I worked for, would jack me up on the spot. Uh, I don't see that happening much anymore. You know, what I see a lot of is, boy, that person's not my unit. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to worry about it. Um, and and I, I, I don't like that. Uh, I don't like the fact that we aren't sort of self-policing ourselves and, and holding each other accountable. Um, but, but, uh, but again, on the, on the positive side, I, I, I think the Air Force, continually get stronger. We, you know, our, obviously the weapon systems we have now are, are more advanced than they were in the past, but the folks that we have operating those systems are, are, are pretty smart and pretty technically savvy. Um, I do get, uh, I'll, let me give you an example of something I am concerned about. Maybe you've heard this because I certainly don't want to get political here and I won't, but uh, I was recently down at, a, at an Air Force base and for the, this was last year for the 75th anniversary of the Air Force. And a, a, a group of airmen pulled me aside and said, you know, because a lot of them, if they didn't know me, know me, they had heard of me and they know that I really am apolitical. I'm not one party or the other. I mean, I'm pretty much down the middle uh, and I rarely even talk about politics. But they said, we know you're not a political guy. But they said, you know, we don't like hearing retired senior general officers telling everyone on national TV that the military is, is quote unquote woke. And to be honest with you, I don't even know what that means. Um, and I'm not sure those who say that know what it means. But they were they were not, they said, look, we don't want to get in politics either, but we believe we're as combat ready as they were when they were in. So I wish they wouldn't do that. And again, I'm not making a political statement with that. I'm just saying, I think that contributes to the way the Air Force has changed over time. Because, and what I'm getting at here is the social media aspect that commanders and first sergeants have to deal with now that I didn't have to deal with. And regardless of what party you are in, political party, you're being bombarded with stuff all day long. You know, the other side's bad. The other side's the enemy. The other side wants to take the country down the tubes. And regardless of what 
jersey you wear, red or blue, you know, they are being bombarded with that stuff all day long. And so now commanders and, and, uh, and first sergeants have to deal with that. Uh, whereas, again, when I was in, not so much because you didn't have that social media and cable news sort of pounding you all day long with, with politics. So, I, you know, that's, that's a challenge, I think, now that, that, that I didn't have to deal with, that when I talk to commanders in the field, it's something they have to deal with almost every day. Yeah, I can definitely see that being a challenge, too. Um, that's, that's really all the questions that I have um, right now, General Spencer. Um, so what I, we hit that hour mark, I think. So if you want, we could end it here. Sure. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this onto my social medias uh, as well as my YouTube. That way I can get it out to the people. Um, you know, who are looking for those opportunities and want to hear your story, you know, all of the obstacles that you had to overcome um, to get that high up, which is truly amazing. So um, I just want to say thank you. Um, truly an honor to, to get on here, be able to talk to you, hear your story, um, get your story out there more. That way other people can hear it and hopefully become inspired by it to join the Air Force um, and get their education and, you know, try to rise to the ranks of the Air Force and help us. So well, thank, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for your service. You, you've got a tough job, uh, but uh, we need you. So thank you for what you're doing, and uh, if I can ever help you, let me know. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right. See you later. All right. Bye.